I'm Christina Bergen, and I'm reading for Xantippe. James Savatko, reading for Socrates. Kevin Herman, reading for Apollodorus. Mitch Owens, reading for Zenus. Sandy Gardner, reading for Morona. I'm Marcus Telefuente, I'm reading for Antisthenes and Lamphocles. I'm Tim Rees, and I'm reading for Agathon and Aristophanes. I'm Jeremy Johnson, I'm reading for Alcibiades and the narrator. I'm Steve Isaac, and I'm reading for the moderator. Xanatippi, scene one, a street in Athens. Socrates stands in a trance on a front porch at right. After a moment, two young Athenian men, Apollodorus and Zenus, enter from left. Apollodorus is a rogue, and Zenus his friend. Apollodorus, in particular, is good-looking. The old man's really been giving me a hard time about coughing up the dough this time. What does he expect me to do, get a job? I know. Parents can be so unreasonable. <laughs> I mean, he acts as though it's my fault the damn horse broke its leg right in the home stretch. How was I supposed to know that was going to happen when I made the bet? Well, anyway, as the great Homer says, all's fair in love and war which is definitely good advice for dealing with one's parents. One way or another, I'm going to get the money out of them, even if I have to... That has got to be the ugliest statue I have ever seen. How could somebody try to pass an eyesore like that off as a work of art? That's not a statue, Apollodorus. That's Socrates, the wisest man in all of Greece. Oh, Pete, you! So that explains it. I wondered what that horrible smell was. They say he doesn't believe in taking a bath at least once a month, like the rest of us. <laughs> it's not that he was raised in a barn, it's just that his mind is occupied with more vapory, vacuous, philosophical things, like being and, and becoming, instead of vulgar, unimportant things like the body and, and bathing, that's all. He's the guy who figured out that the truly wise man is he who knows he knows nothing. That's why the oracle at Delphi called him the wisest mortal alive. Well, it sounds like a fool's wisdom to me. So I guess that means every jackass you meet is a genius. Or a philosopher. Uh, no. Uh, no, you're missing the point. There, there's a difference between knowing nothing and knowing you know nothing. Oh, of course, I see. <laughs> Silly me. Sort of like if you're stupid, but you know you're stupid, then you're actually smart, huh? <laughs> Very funny. You just don't have the makings of a philosopher. Thank you. But I know an old bum when I see one. And for somebody who doesn't know anything, they say he's pretty good at sniffing out all the best dinner parties. And by the way, where are his shoes? Oh, oh, but I forgot. He probably doesn't need any. I suppose his head is so light with all those thoughts of the heavens it's full of that he usually just floats along up in the clouds somewhere. He doesn't spend much time down here on Earth. And another thing, can you please tell me why he is just standing there like a damn bump on a log? I guess all that food and drink he sucked in at Alcibiades must have temporarily grounded him. If he needs some assistance getting a move on it, I'll be happy to give him a little help. Don't you know anything? You've been spending too much time at the law courts and the horse races. Everybody knows that every once in a while, Socrates gets so wrapped up in thinking something really deep and and awful that he just loses all touch with reality and goes off on his own little world somewhere. Sometimes he just stands there all day, off in another dimension. You mean Dada Land? So you're telling me that if I went over there and gave him a good slap upside the head, he wouldn't know what or who the hell hit him, literally? Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, there's only one way to find out for sure. You wait right here. Starts walking to Socrates. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, Apollodorus, you're not going to assault the greatest philosopher in all of Greece, are you? Still walking. Hey, hey, wait up! Clinius wanted me to make sure Socrates was coming to his dinner tonight. Oh, you don't have to worry about that. If there's free food and booze, you can be sure Socrates will be there. It's easy to be poor and run around looking down on everybody else when you've got plenty of rich friends to leech off of. I don't buy this trance thing for one minute. These quacks will do anything to make a name for themselves. He's a fraud, and I'll prove it. I'll bring him back to reality. No, uh, Apollodorus, for God's sake, don't. You'll kill him. All right, all right. Get a hold of yourself. I wasn't really going to hit him. Yeah, sure. Be quiet and watch this. <clears throat> uh, pardon me there, old man. Sir, 
Can you please tell me the way to the nearest brothel? Apollodorus. All right, all right, let me try something else. Grabs his nose. That's a mighty big nose you've got there, sir. Apollodorus, stop it right now. Get away from him. Besides, it's, it's not going to do you any good. I told you, when he's philosophizing, he's just like a zombie. Now, he may have taken you all in, but he doesn't fool me. This guy's not off contemplating the universe somewhere. The only deep thoughts he's thinking are about who he can bum his next meal off of. Wait! I know how to get his attention. <clears throat> say, Zenus, my man, where's the party tonight? At Clinius's? And did you say Alcibiades is going to be there, right? Breaking his trance. Party? Alcibiades? Did someone say something about a party and Alcibiades? See? What did I tell you? <laughs> Under his breath. Sir. Knock it off! Socrates, I I'm glad I found you here. I wanted to let you know about the party tonight at Clinias's. He wanted me to make sure you got his invitation. Well, thank you, Zenas, my fine young friend. Eating is good for the soul, or at least it beats starving. And who, may I ask, is your fine, handsome young friend? This is Apollodorus, son of Callias. It is uh, most definitely a pleasure to meet you. You are indeed your father's son, quite the picture of good health. I have all is well with Callias. He and I used to have many conversations at the gym. Yes, he's warned me, <clears throat> I mean, told me uh, all about you. I've been trying to enlighten Apollodorus here by, by telling him all about your philosophy, about how you don't know anything, or <laughs> I mean, how you know you know nothing. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, with the sense he's getting himself deeper all the time. But he's skeptical. I, I don't think he's a philosopher. Ah, Zenus, philosophy is concerned with the head, not the heart. The heart is the part of the body that has all the uh, dense, warm blood in it. The head, however, is where the light, airy thoughts swirl around. Speaking of airy, it does seem a bit windy in here all of a sudden. Shut up. After all, it is well known fact that people tend not to philosophize as much when their heads have been removed. Don't give me any ideas, old man. Zenus hits him again. Not everyone is cut out for the study of philosophy. Just a select few. Maybe we can talk it over more at dinner tonight. My fine, vigorous-looking young man. Maybe I can convert you. All I know is I know nothing. Which I'll prove to you if you talk to me long enough. So I've heard. But I do think I've pretty much mastered the main part of your philosophy. Is there anything more to it than just being ignorant? <clears throat> well, my basic philosophy routine, for dinner parties, of course, is first I prove I don't know anything. Then I prove you don't know anything. And then, if the wine lasts, I prove that nobody knows anything. And if it turns into a really riotous drunken brawl, I uh, pull out all the stops and drink everyone under the table discussing virtue. What's amazing is, nobody's ever seen Socrates drunk. No matter how much he drinks, he, even if he's been at it all night, he's just as sharp as ever and can out-argue anyone. Yes, I've wondered about that. How exactly is it, Socrates, that you remain so completely in control even if you drink enough to kill a horse? Or two? Is it because of your philosophy? Oh, well, no, my young friend. It's just that over the years, you know, I've uh, developed... A high tolerance? But, but what amazes me even more is, than his ability to outslosh the biggest luscious who've ever lived is his ability to withstand Alcibiades' charms. If you don't mind my mentioning it, Socrates, he, even Alcibiades mentions uh, he never had any luck with you. At one of Agathon's parties not that long ago, Alcibiades told everybody about how he made a pass at Socrates once but Socrates completely ignored him. Alcibiades thought that just because he was so good-looking, he could seduce Socrates without any effort, if he really wanted to. So he waited one night till after dinner, when, when everybody else had left, and, and he and Socrates were alone. It was during the winter, so Alcibiades seized on that as a pretense for putting his cloak around Socrates and holding him in his arms, saying he just wanted to keep him warm, which by the way, I think would have been pretty thoughtful of him if it had been true. But anyway, 
Alcibiades was sure Socrates would try something if he did that, but even though Alcibiades held him all night, when the next morning came and it was time for Socrates to leave, nothing more had happened than if they had been brothers sleeping together. I'm glad I'm not in your family, but I agree. That certainly is a very unusual display of denial and self-control. I mean, it must have been very hard to allow one of the best-looking men in all of Greece to hold you tight in a bear hug all night and not just get up and walk away. Sounds as though he's got the old hard-to-get routine down pretty well. From off stage. Socrates, I see you there. Where have you been hiding all day? Just wait until I get my hands oh, on you. Oh, Zeus is to be. She's found me out. Well, gentlemen, I, I really uh, enjoyed our little check. My inner voice tells me it's time to run. I, I mean, uh, hide. I mean, uh, bye. He sure hightailed it out of here pretty fast. That doesn't seem very philosophical to me. What happened to his otherworldly detachment? Uh, you'd be scared, too, if you had a wife like that. Oh, no. Here she comes. Where did that no-good Socrates sneak off to? I saw him standing here talking more of his damn nonsense. Uh, he took off in a hurry, like a witch was after him. <laughs> in that direction. I'll come back and scratch her eyes out later, my smart-mouthed young man. She hurries off in the direction of Socrates. You better watch it. Believe me, you don't want Xantope on your case. I'll take my chances. So tell me, why did he marry her anyway? She's so hard to get along with. Did they have to? No, of course not. Why does anybody get married? I guess he's a glutton for punishment. My parents fight all the time, too. Don't yours? I think that's what married people are supposed to do. Socrates does seem to get a bit of a raw deal, though. Usually a marriage is pretty much a toss-up. The wife fights with her mouth and the husband with his hands. So it's pretty much an even battle. But Santope does both. First she nags him, and then she beats him. Well, if he lets her do it, he's only got himself to blame. Scene 2, Marketplace. Socrates runs in full speed ahead, glancing backward to see how he's doing. He collides with a booth set up by a mask maker. Hey, watch where you're going, buddy. In your damn eyes, what's the big idea? I wanted to hear like a maniac. I'm sorry, Antisthenes, but you've got to help me. Socrates, it's you. My god, I'm sorry. I mistook you for another one of those damn beggars that keeps plaguing us. The market's full of them. What is it? What's the matter? <sighs> Xanthippe is after me. She's hot on the trail and hot on my tail. You know, I can't let her find me. If she catches me, she'll skin me alive, and then I won't be able to go to Lenisthenes' party tonight. You've got to help me. Off stage. Socrates! Here, quick. Put this on and don't say a word. Hand Socrates a donkey mask. Just stand there and keep quiet. Socrates! Now where did that damn bum go? I know I saw him go this way. He can run, but he cannot hide. I know all of his usual hangouts, and it's, it's just going to get harder on him when I do find him. She talks to Antiphonies and throws a quick but suspicious glance at Socrates, disguising standing near him. Pardon me, sir. Did you happen to notice a big rat just come running through here in the past few minutes? Nope. Didn't see a thing. No rats around here, ma'am. Not one all day. In this part of town? That's a lie. You must be hiding something. Well, all right then. Since we're so bold, if the truth be told, I've seen so many I can't remember any. Ah, very good. But if you value your life, listen to what I say. Lie to an angry wife and it's judgment day. Okay, I can't make any promises. But all right, tell me. What did this rat look like? Well, for starters, it's about six feet tall. I know that's holy. That's bigger than the most giant-esque sewer rat I've ever heard of. I'm sure I would have noticed something like that if it had gone by. But I better be sure. I'm scared to ask, but is there anything else I should know about it? Let's see. It has white hair and is about 60 years old and can talk your ear off spouting a lot of damn fool nonsense about philosophy. God, lady, that's not a rat you're talking about. That's a damn demon or a freak of nature you're describing. Are you sure you maybe haven't been hitting the bottle just a little bit? I am sure! I'll say I'm married to him! Ugh, please, lady, don't say another word. I don't want to hear it. This is a respectable establishment running here. Let's just pretend you never brought up the subject. I, for one, promise I won't tell anybody. Look, buddy, you can cut the crap right now. I saw my husband coming this way, and I know he's got to be around here somewhere. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if you're hiding him. 
I eye Socrates again. You know that jackass sure looks familiar. Oh, that, that's not for sale. It's just on display. It's for Aristophanes' new play. He's already bought it. It's picking up tomorrow. Maybe I could interest you in one of these other masks. One of these gorgons would suit you perfectly. How about Medusa here? So, Aristophanes has another play coming out? Does he? The drunk? <laughs> well, if he needs an ass's mask, it must be another one about my husband. I'm ruined. One more play by Aristophanes about Socrates and his damn stupidity and it'll be the end of me. I was the laughing stock of the town after that last one. The clouds came out. All the women in the marketplace made fun of me, saying every nasty thing they could think of about how I had a lunatic numbskull of a husband who flew around in baskets like a madman. And what was worse? I had to agree with them. Maybe I should stop and destroy this jackass before Aristophanes gets his hands on it. Achoo! Sir, I believe your mannequin has just sneezed. That must be a very remarkable dummy. What do you mean sneeze? I didn't hear anything. Xantippe hits the donkey hard. Ouch! Oh, and it talks too! I didn't hear anything. I think your imagination is getting the best of you. I know an ass when I hear one, and I'll be damned if that didn't sound exactly like my husband. She slugs him again and tries to take the mask off, but Socrates holds it. They struggle. Now your dummy's fighting me. It must be possessed. I'd better kill it. I wouldn't want to be in old Socrates' shoes right now if he had any. After a struggle, Xantippe succeeds in pulling the mask off. Busted. Ah, uh, what is it, Xantippe, my little sweet bee? Oh, don't sweet pee me, you old monster. Where have you been all day? Off gallivanting all over a town? Again with your fancy friends? And I suppose you've got another one of your banquets lined up for tonight. While your wife and children are home eating somebody else's scraps that I've had to scrounge up from the garbage piles at the market. It's not good to waste the food. Xantippe hits him violently while he tries to fend her off. During the following speech, she alternates between beating him up and sobbing pitifully. Don't give me any more of your damn lessons on economizing. I already make a church mouse look extravagant. Save them for all your big spender friends. She busts into tears. I don't know any other woman that would put up with this. Just let you walk all over me? Nobody else would be stupid enough to let you take advantage of them the way I do. My father warned me about marrying a philosopher. He told me I would regret it, but I didn't believe him. When I heard about how much Gorgias and all the others were charging their students, I thought you'd really rake in the dough like the rest of them. Everybody said you could outbabble them. But I was a fool. I married the only philosopher dumb enough to blab it all away for nothing. Oh, but would I care if you spent all day talking to every idiot in town who was dumb enough to listen, if you can at least make a buck doing it. But no, you can't stop these guns from flapping in the breeze in the direction anybody will look your way. Free to charge. No, you couldn't take a dime from anybody because you were too damn good to earn an honest living. Like everybody else. Well, let me tell you something. Your wife and children are the one who really have to pay the price for all your fancy philosophy talk. Socrates, who thinks she has weakened sufficiently, begins to slowly back up as though he's going to try to make off while the going's good. Where do you think you're sneaking off to, old man? I just can't take it anymore. Get away from me. Leave me alone. She runs off. That's some wife you got there. Uh, do be quiet. Why do you let her hit you like that? Any day I'd let some woman attack me, I'd send her flying. What? Did you want me to get into a boxing match with her right here? Uh, 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 this, that's one for Xantippe. Oh, and then there's one for Socrates. Do you want it to be the talk of Athens, how Socrates beat up his wife in the marketplace? You don't have to worry about that, Socrates. We all know who the one getting beat up is. Here, let me give you a cloak to put over yourself. Scene 3. Xantippe is scrubbing the floor in a room of the house while her son Lamphrocles runs around holding a bowl as a toy. Lamphrocles, I already told you once and I'm not going to tell you again, young man. Put that down before you break it. She keeps on cleaning as he's running. 
He trips and drops the bowl and starts crying. She stands up. Now see what you've done. I told you to put that thing down before you broke it. Now go to your room this instant, young man. And don't come out until I tell you you can. I didn't mean to break it, Mommy. Go to your room this instant. Young brats who don't listen to their mother don't need supper. You're going to grow up and be like your worthless father. Running off. I hate you. I hate you. I wish you were dead. Lamprocles, get back here right now, young man, and apologize. She slides down to a semi-seated position and just starts crying. <laughs> Enters hesitatingly. <laughs> Xanthropy, are you all right? If this is a bad time, I can come back later. She stands up and slowly regains her spirits and she begins to talk. Morona, I don't know how much longer I can put up with this. It's the same thing every day. Socrates out on the town from morning till night, living it up with his rich friends, while the kids and I are stuck in this dump. He's a regular socialite. Hardly an evening even goes by when he hasn't gotten an invitation from another one of his no-good friends who doesn't have anything better to do than just get drunk every night. Well, I'm sick and tired of it. Do you know how hard it is to try to make a decent meal when there's no food in the house? Now the kids are starting to resent me because I'm the one who has to discipline them all the time. Well, since their father's never around. And you know how long it's been since I've had a new dress? I've been wearing this same damn rag since the day we were married. I never have anything new and pretty to wear at any of the festivals like all the other women. Whenever some rich old hag wants to put somebody down, she says, Where'd she get that potato sack? She looks like the wife of Socrates. Personally, I've never understood how you've been able to put up with things as long as you have. I would have murdered him a long time ago. I've been trying to think of a way to come up with some money, since I can't count on my husband for anything. But I can't think of anything realistic. I've thought about becoming a housebreaker, but I don't know what'll happen to my kids if I get caught. I've even thought about setting up shop in the marketplace, but the problem is I don't know what I could do or sell. I'm no goddamn good at fortune telling except for predicting my own future, which doesn't look good. And when weaving and basket making have never been my strong points. Arts and crafts are a decent way to make a living, to be sure, but there are older, more profitable professions. You don't mean prop, <coughs> prostitute, <coughs> prostitute, okay, hey, do you really think I, okay, but what would my children think if they found out their mother was, uh, tramp, uh, harlot, slut, whore? Thank you. Who says you have to tell them? We have our little secrets. <laughs> I wouldn't, but somebody else would. Well, it's just an idea. I'm only trying to help. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh, what am I going to do? You'll think of something. Okay, let's take stock of the situation. The way I see it, you've got three options. You can either leave him, sue him, or kill him. But I can't leave him. Where would I go? I can't go home. My father's wedding present to me was this advice. You can marry that damn bum if you want, but when you finally figure out how worthless he is, don't come running home to me crying, which naturally will me made me want to marry him all the more at the time. You could always go abroad. What? And raise my children like beggars in a foreign country? Well, that still leaves two options. Then I have no choice at all. It's not worth killing him for the same reason it's not worth suing him. He doesn't have any money. Good point. Wait, I got it. What? Well, you know what they say, if you can't beat him, join him! What do you mean? What do you want me to do? Abandon my kids every night and start tagging along with him in those drunken parties at Alcibiades? Of course not. What I mean is, turn the tables on him and use his philosophy against him. Challenge him to a public debate and put his reputation on the line. Then, when he loses, he'll be so humiliated, he'll have to give up philosophizing forever. In other words, if you can't join him, beat him. Hmm, that's a great idea. It's perfect, as a matter of fact. But what if he won't agree to it? Believe me, he'll agree. 
He knows that if he doesn't, you can make his life a living hell. <laughs> but I thought I already do make his life a living hell. Yes, you do. And that's why it's in his best interest to agree to this debate. He's got nothing to lose and much to gain, namely peace and quiet. If he wins, you'll agree to stop pounding him about philosophy and let him spend all the time he wants babbling to his friends. But what if I lose? Then things will pretty much stay the same. Since that's what he does right now, I don't see how things could get worse. <laughs> You're right. But do you really think I could pull it off? I mean, they say he's pretty good. You know what Aristophanes said about how he can make the worst argument defeat the better? They say he can make mincemeat of the most petty, low-life, slippery-tongued, weaselly lawyer you've ever met. Of course. He's much worse than a lawyer. He's a philosopher. But even Athena herself, then, wouldn't have a chance in Hades against him. And I'm just a country girl. Don't worry. You're underestimating yourself, Xantippe. You've got an even bigger advantage. What? Please tell me. Your mouth. All wives are naturally gifted at out-arguing their husbands. Don't tell me you didn't know that. If you claim otherwise, that's an assault upon our sex. What, were you an orphan child? Didn't your mother scold and nag your father all the time? <laughs> yes. And didn't she worry him and wear down his nerves until he was practically a walking vegetable? Yeah, but he deserved it. There! Now you're coming around. That's the spirit. Just remember, while Socrates is preparing himself for the debate by getting all calm and philosophical and detached, you work yourself up into a fury and let nature take its course. Just pretend he was out all night at a party and you were trapped at home and think of how upset you would be. Just get yourself all emotional and crazy. Really let yourself go wild. That should do the trick, no problem. In fact, I think I'm starting to pity the poor guy. As she talks, she becomes increasingly furious. But he was out all night. That no good bum. Not that it's anything new, of course. I'm always, always home slaving away, being the man and the woman of the house while he's off partying all over town with his damn friends. He can talk up a storm with all of his fine talk about being a good person, but if he's such a good husband and father... Scene 4. Socrates enters in the dark. Xantippe has booby-trapped the door with pots and pans. Socrates trips and stumbles. The heavens above! Murder in the night! Evil is the world in which we live! I, oh, much better is the place to which I go. Come rushing in the room. What, what the hell is going on in here? Who's making all that racket? If it's a burglar, you definitely have come to the wrong house. There's nothing worth stealing in this rundown shack. In fact, if you don't get out of here right now, I may rob you. Oh, Socrates, it's you. Sorry, I must have forgotten to put those pots and pans away. A uh, lucky a uh, man is uh, who has a loving wife to come home to. Don't give me any of your wisecracks, buddy. A man who comes traipsing in at the crack of dawn every day is lucky he even has a wife who hasn't killed him. It's nice of you to sneak in and grace your wife and children with your presence while they're sleeping. No doubt all your talk did a lot to improve the morals of your damn drinking buddies before they all passed out. Are you plastered? How many fingers am I holding up? Uh, Xantippe, you'll wake up the children. It if you continue on like this, let's do call it a night. Don't try to use those kids to protect yourself, you overgrown coward. My talking won't wake the children, although an old man scream for help might. I can tell you one thing, though. I'm not putting up with this for one more day. I'm putting the end of these things once and for all tonight. Uh, by Apollo, it is wrong to take your own life, Santity. The gods do not approve of suicide. And your children would not have anyone to take care of them. If I killed anyone, it wouldn't be me, you worthless old bum! Ugh, if you were smart, you'd be more worried about saving your own life instead of mine. If you wish to discuss anything in a way that will tend to improve either one of us, Antipi, I will be happy to indulge you. If not, I really must be going to bed. I must say, I do feel a bit fatigued after exerting myself so strenuously eating and uh, talking all night. I should break your damn neck after that little stunt you pulled in the marketplace today. You're just lucky I'm such a pushover, you old bastard. Or would have killed you a long time ago. 
But fortunately, I'm not that kind of person who holds grudges, damn you. I believe in rising above things. The fact that you're still breathing proves it. But if for once in your fool life you finally said something that had an ounce of sense in it. A talk is exactly what I want. In fact, a debate would be more like it. I want to have it out once and for all like a civilized, rational person. I want to see whether you're as good as all your flaky philosophy as you claim you are. I don't think I heard you correctly. I thought, I just heard you say you wanted to have a rational discussion for a change. Uh, either something is wrong with my ears, or I'm afraid you must have hurt yourself while I was out today. Uh, please don't take this the wrong way. But did you fall and hit your head when I was gone, Centipede? Uh, 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 but please, don't let me interrupt. Please feel free to continue. Oh, I guess being married to Mr. Smooth Talker has finally rubbed off on me. What, are you scared of your wife? And that she'll make you look like a fool in front of the whole city? Ah, they say if you live long enough, you'll see and hear it all. And it must be true. By the gods above, who would have thought that at my age there was something like this waiting to spring on me around the bend? Xanthipi, a philosopher. By Zeus, I'm absolutely thunderstruck. Never in my wildest dreams, and uh, believe me, I've had uh, some pretty wild dreams, especially after some of those uh, parties at Alcibiades. Anyway, perhaps I've underestimated you this past decade, my little tulip. Truly, Xanthipi. Never more during our marriage have I felt more like giving you a hug and a kiss. Don't you come near me, you old leech! I mean it or I'll throttle you with my own bare hands. Don't go getting all excited in your parties and then come home here all hot to trot. Oh, you can roar like a lion if you will, my little apple dumpling. Uh, but the sound of your sweet voice will always be music to my ears. <clears throat> I agree wholeheartedly to this debate. <clears throat> I'm absolutely astounded. Here I've been wandering around this city all these years, like a like adult, eagerly looking for someone to take up as an opponent. And yet all this time, right under my very nose, was my own darling little wife, waiting to be my next victim, uh, 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 opponent, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, I am uh, more than willing to discuss with you anything you want in your uh, public forums, entity. Okay, but there are certain terms and conditions. Now, this is beginning to sound more like the Zen Tippy I know. As I'm sure you'll agree, there isn't enough room under this roof for more than one philosopher. Mm. Everybody knows that if you put two philosophers together in a room, let alone in a house, there's certain to be a war or death with all of their damn quibbling and nonsense. So whichever one of us happens to lose, has to agree to give up philosophizing. At least if they want to continue living or remain in this house. And the one who wins can do all of the damn philosophizing they want to, wherever they want to, whenever they want to, without any interference from the other. Agreed? I don't know what this means. Perhaps the end of the world. But it's an omen from above. A blessed miracle. Uh, you are indeed correct, my little darling, considering how much uh, having one philosopher in the house has been uh, conducive to uh, domestic harmony. I don't think any of us could survive long with another around. So, I accept your terms and conditions, uh, but there is one more detail. Who is to judge this contest? <laughs> Who shall determine the winner? Anyone or his brother. What in the Hades do I care who it is that decides you're a damn fool? Anyone in Athens can come to that conclusion. The truly wise man does not heed the decision of the rabble. He follows the truth as it appears to his own soul. He uses his own mind and reason to arrive at the way things really are and should be. Then, even if the whole town be against him, he has obeyed the most important voice, and has acted correctly. Therefore, I'm afraid I can't agree to abide by the decision of just anyone, only a wise man. 
if anyone other than a sage chooses the winner, well, then I will be forced to rely on my own judgment to determine the outcome and the true victor of our contest. Listen, buddy. You've been judge and jury long enough. Now we're going to give somebody else a turn. Let me impart some wisdom to your soul. There are two ways you can participate in this debate. The easy way or the hard way. Either you'll get up there on the platform using your own two feet, or I'll drag you up there kicking and screaming. Get the picture? Good! Scene 5. Street in Athens. Apollodorus is walking along when Zenus rushes upon him from behind, excited. Apollodorus, where have you been? I've been looking for you all afternoon. Did you hear the news? I've been running errands and had appointments all day. What news? Oh, yeah, about your friend, the philosopher. It's all over town about how his charming wife gave him a pretty good drubbing in the marketplace. Again. <laughs> no, that, that's old news. I mean, the latest news. Oh my god, she finally killed him! Yippee! I made a huge bet with Aristodemus about that a while ago. Yes! By Zeus, that's the best news I've had all day. Now I don't have to worry about that damn horse racing dead anymore. I have to run and get my money. No, that's not it. She didn't kill him, for God's sake. No, she didn't? No. She challenged him to a debate tomorrow at the town center. And listen to this. If she wins, he's agreed to give up philosophy. If he wins, she's promised to stop being such an unbearable old hag. Everybody's going to be there, the whole town. I can imagine. They're probably hoping it'll turn into another one of their brawls. Hey, maybe she'll do him in yet. Maybe right there at the debate tomorrow. You're hopeless. But come on, follow me. Agathon is having a party tonight for Socrates, a pre-victory celebration. Isn't that just a bit premature? Not at all. You don't really think she'll win, do you? But we want to do everything we can to help cheer Socrates on to victory. The dinner's probably over by now, but the after-dinner drinking and philosophy should just be getting started. Come on, let's go. Okay, okay. Scene 6. Agathon's Place. A servant announces Apollodorus and Zenus' arrival as they enter the dinner party. A small group of mostly young men. Aristophanes and Socrates are present as well. Ah, look who's here, everyone. Apollodorus and Zenus. We had all just about given up on you two. Now, Alcibiades is the only one we're missing. Come, do come over here and sit by Socrates and me. Yes, do. Uh, we walk to our couches. I, I hope you'll agree this is a case of better late than never. Certainly. It's good to see you both. Yes, two handsome young men like yourselves will definitely make an excellent addition to our little gathering here. In that case, maybe I should say, I hope you didn't miss us too much. Uh -huh. Well, obviously you've heard the, the big news. How couldn't we? That's all everyone's been talking about. Is it true, Socrates, you, you'd really give up philosophy? Well, that's the deal at any rate, though I won't uh, comment on the likelihood of such a conclusion to the event. Uh, but I will, of course, abide by the terms, however the debate turns out. After all, um, if I'm such a poor philosopher that I can't hold my own against Xantippe, then I've taken up the wrong cause. <clears throat> I shouldn't be uh, making it my life's work to just go around claiming to enlighten all the uh, attractive young men in this city. Well, as you know, gentlemen, this isn't just another one of our friendly little drinking bouts. In light of today's events, I have decided to hold this emergency dinner party with Socrates here as our guest of honor. And, in keeping with the spirit of the occasion, we decided before you got here to forego our usual method of entertaining ourselves drinking ourselves blind, to help make sure that Socrates here isn't forced into early retirement. Not that there's any chance of that happening, of course. Here we are! Here. I propose a toast, gentlemen, to Socrates, the greatest philosopher of our time. To, to Socrates. Socrates! Bottoms up. As I was saying, to help Socrates prepare for the big debate tomorrow, we have asked him to hold a sort of practice exercise for the benefit of all of us here tonight. Have you decided yet, Socrates, what subject you will take up for our enlightenment? Uh, since you are our host tonight, Agathon, I will leave that decision up to you. Ah, very well then, Socrates. The presence of so many of Athens' finest here tonight inspires me. 
And since love is the one subject that even you profess to be an expert on, I propose that the topic of our, of your discussion, be the nature of love. You are right, my friend. This is indeed the one subject I claim to have a special knowledge of, and so uh, we could go. Uh... Not so fast, Socrates, old boy. I object, since we all owe our dinner tonight and entertainment tomorrow to our distinguished guest's marital bliss, I propose that in honor of his extraordinary wife, yes, I mean Xantippe, in case you're all wondering who I'm talking about, I propose that the particular form of love known as marriage be the subject of Socrates' talk. <laughs> <laughs> Very well, then. This isn't a court of law, Aristophanes, but your objection is duly noted and approved. That is, as long as Socrates agrees. Agreed. Marriage. Now, that's a subject you should really have special expertise about, Socrates. Expertise, no. Nightmares, yes. But remember, my young friend, your day is coming as well. It's every young man's fate to settle down and raise a family once he's had a chance to sow his uh, wild oats. Married people like to say things like that to scare single people, but I'm sure I can take some comfort in the fact that it would be hard to find another Xantippe. She's quite a prize. Not so hard as you might wish, perhaps. Uh, it's true that Xantippe has more of the fury in her than most, but I think there's a lot of Xantippe in all women. But Xantippe does deserve credit for this. She has been an exemplary wife in one respect. She has definitely helped steel me against any possible form of adversity life could offer. But let's leave Zempity to scrubbing the floor or whatever else she may be doing to prepare herself for tomorrow, and turn our attention to the proposed topic of our nice little dinner chat. I believe, John, you know the uh, procedure by now, to prevent me from just flying off on a wild tangent somewhere, I would like to ask a few questions to make sure we all agree on a couple of basic points before I really go off the deep end. Certainly. I'm glad to find you all so cooperative. Uh, Zenas, uh, if you will be so kind as to help us all find our way on this difficult subject, let us first investigate Aristophanes' contention that marriage is a kind of love. Do you believe, along with our esteemed poet here, that love and marriage are one and the same thing? Or are they two different things? Two very different things, I should say, Socrates, since it appears that we often find one without the other. In fact, they often seem to be as unlike as any two things can be. Ha! Very good. Now, clearly, if we are to arrive at the truth in this matter, we must first consider what are the general types of love and marriage. And then we must uh, further examine each in turn to try to determine what, if, anything, it is that these things have in common, so that we can be true to identify the true nature of love. Uh, don't uh, you agree? Uh, yes, of course. Then, uh, let us begin. <clears throat> first, what are the kinds of love? Well, uh, first, of course, there's love of family, is in the love you feel for your mother and father and sisters and brothers. Even if you hate them and want to kill them? Ignoring him. And there's love of friends. Then there's love of men and women you aren't related to and aren't friends with. But now or... you're getting to the good part, Zenas. Don't forget the kind of love someone feels for their pets, or the kind of love a farmer feels for the animals on his farm. Oh, that's not love. That's sickness. And doesn't love in general often strike you as being a kind of malady or sickness? So, Aristophanes, since you seem to have taken over for young Zenas here, what pray tell, then, are the kinds of marriage, uh, unless there's anything there's anything you'd like to add, uh, Zenas. No, that uh, just about covers it. It's widely known that there are two kinds of marriage, bad and worse. And do you agree, Zenas? Well, truly, Socrates, from all I see and hear, I would say it doesn't appear to be far from the truth. Upon that note, gentlemen, I would like to propose a toast to Xantippe. To Xantippe! And so, gentlemen, now that we have determined what are the various forms of love and marriage, is there anything else we can ascertain they have in common, which will help us come to an understanding 
of the true nature of love. Why, even a fool could see it, that it's so obvious. Misery. Scene 7. Town center of Athens. Socrates and Xantippe stand on a platform. Alcibiades is standing off to one side, looking up at Socrates. And Baroda is standing off to the other side by Xantippe. Make sure you put her in her place, Socrates. I thought Xantippe's needed to be taken down a peg or two for a while now. We don't want these broads to start getting any funny ideas. All of us women are counting on you, Xantippe. Don't let us down. Our husbands will never let us forget if you let him get the better of you. <laughs> Thanks. That really takes the pressure off. We'll do fine. Remember what we talked about yesterday? And if that doesn't help, if you start to feel yourself get tongue-tied or need inspiration, just think of what your life would have been like if you'd married a rich man who spoiled you rotten. <laughs> Maybe I should forget the debate and just kill him. Perfect. That's what I want to hear. Break a leg. Preferably his. Goes to her seat. Ladies and gentlemen, we are gathered here today for a very special event. No, this man, Socrates, and this woman, Xantippe, are not here to join together in heavenly matrimony. They've already experienced that joy and are now years past that day of happiness, I can assure you. Instead, you are about to witness a very remarkable and unparalleled occurrence in our history. For the first time in our illustrious city, a husband and wife are going to debate some of the greatest philosophical issues of all time. They each have much at stake in this contest. Socrates, one of our most famous philosophers, has agreed that if he loses, he will forever renounce philosophizing within the walls of this city. Ooh, that philosopher! And Xantippe has agreed that if she loses, she will um, uh, uh, stop nagging her husband to death. Ooh. Yeah. These are the terms that you both have really agreed to. With the people of Athens as witnesses, I ask you now to both affirm your willingness to be bound by the judgment of the majority decision of those present. Do you both agree to let the citizens of Athens choose the winner of this competition and adhere to the rules of conduct governing you if you should lose. I, I do. do. Very well then, let's get started. There will be at least two, possibly three topics for debate. The first two will be the one and the many, and being and becoming. If necessary, there will be a third topic, a tiebreaker on the value of the philosophic life. Socrates won the drawing of lots that was held earlier to decide who gets to speak first, and thus he will begin. Socrates, are you ready? I certainly am, my fine friend. Uh, but, with your permission, I would like to ask for assistance from someone here in our audience. My friends know it is a habit of mine to always ask their help in arriving at the truth in our discussions. And so, if you don't mind, I would like to ask Zenas here if you would be willing to answer a few questions. By all means, Socrates. Why can't you ever just give a straight answer? Why do you always have to have someone else do your dirty work? Xantippe, please wait your turn. As I was saying, it is customary for me to start out by asking a few preliminary questions of my admirers. <clears throat> Zenas, <clears throat> would you be willing uh, to give me a hand? Of course, Socrates. Please, feel free to ask me whatever you want, and I'll do my best to try to answer it. Very well, then. <clears throat> First, do you agree that the one and the many are two separate things? That is, that there is the one and there is the many? Yes, of course. That is, they are not the same? Y yes, y yes, you're right. I told you he's a genius. That's obvious. Uh, but... If they are not the same, then they are alike in that they are both different. So they are nonetheless the same, though different. Yes, yes, that's all true. I'll be damned if I understood a word of it, but I know you're right. <laughs> Good, I'm glad you agree. You always were one of my better pupils, along with Elcibiades over there. Now, on the other hand, the one is one, which is why we call it one. 
But the many is more than one, which likewise is why we call it the more than one, or the many. Isn't that so? Yes. Every single word of it, true as true can be. All right. <clears throat> but if the one is only one, and the many is more than one, then the one is less than the many and different from it. I thought we already covered that part. Just shut up. Uh, but if the one is less than the many, then the one is also part of the many, which means they are the same. Which brings us back to the same conclusion. The one and the many are both the same and different. <laughs> what did I tell you? An absolute genius, I say. There, there never was a wiser man. Ooh. I'm beginning to understand what you mean when you say all he knows is that he knows nothing. That was a very impressive argument, Socrates. I think it is clear to all of us now why it is that you have justly earned a reputation for your great wisdom, sir. It will indeed be a tough act for Xantippe to follow. All right now, Santippi, it is your turn to speak on the one and the many. Are you ready? Yes, I am. The one and the many. Hmm. All right, all right, everyone. Now, give her some time. Come on, Santippi, remember the strategy. All right, you want to know about the one and the many. I'll tell you about the one and the many. My husband has gone and stayed out all night at one damn party too many. I'm tired of having one bite to eat at the dinner table every night for the kids and me while he's off gorging himself at another of his many gourmet feasts. And he doesn't even bring us a doggy bag. In short, I think I have one worthless husband too many. And I've been married one damn time too many. <laughs> That's the way, Xantippe. Keep it up. Let him have it good. All right. That's a very strong show of support for your first response, Xantippe. The people of Athens have clearly chosen you as the victor for the first question. But there is still our second topic, being and becoming. Socrates, again, will speak first. Whenever you are ready, sir. Looks as though your friend might be in some trouble. <laughs> no way. Uh, once again, I would like to ask whether Zenas would be willing to help me uh, by agreeing to, uh, I mean, answering a few questions. It would be my honor, Socrates. Thank you. Uh, let's get started then, shall we? <clears throat> there is a difference between being something and becoming something. Don't you agree? Uh, a man is a, is a certain age, but he's becoming another age at the same time. So, he is simultaneously being and becoming. Yes. Now then, if a man is being and becoming at the same time, then he can never be anything because he's always becoming something else. Yes. But then again, he can never become anything else if he is never something to begin with. Isn't that so? Yes, every damn word of it. Uh, therefore, a man is both being and becoming, and not being and becoming at the same time. A prodigy, if there ever was one. I say we string this guy up from the nearest available tree. Then he'll have a pretty good idea of what he is and what he's becoming. Well, you seem to have made quite a comeback, Socrates. <clears throat> Tippy, it's your turn again now. What do you have to say on the subject of being and becoming? Plenty! I'm tired of being made a fool of by my damn husband. I am mad, and I am becoming madder. I'm sick and tired of living in a hovel while he's out living the good life all the time with his rich friends. And I am tired of the no good bum and I'm sick of putting up with his damn philosophizing. If you don't shape up, old man, and stop loafing around all over town all day and start supporting your family, I'm going to stop being so damn nice to you. I'm going to become violent. To conclude, your time of being is short, and if you keep up your damn philosophy nonsense, you're about to become history. You like to keep those damn gums flapping in the breeze? 
This will wet your whistle. She picks up a pitcher of water on the podium and pours it over his head. <laughs> First said to be thunders, then she pours. I think it's fair to say it's unanimous. There is clearly no need for a discussion on the merits of the philosophic life to decide the question. Xantippe, I hereby declare you the winner of this debate, and Socrates, I hereby notify you that from this day forward you are forever banned from in any way practicing philosophy within the city of Athens. But it's not fair. I was just getting warmed up. I, in the next part, I was going to get into a no holds bar discussion of the good and the bad. That's my specialty. I'll tell you it's not fair. Making your family the victim of your damn hypocrisy. You may do wonders for all those idle young drunks in the city, but you don't do anything for your kids and me. But the party's over, buddy. You've had your fun. Now we're going to go get you a job. Help!